What's cracking YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. It's your boy Nick Arcolano here. Big dogs gotta eat BDGE fantasy football as usual. We've had some madness go down in the last 24 hours, mainly surrounding the Cleveland Browns. As you know, there have been a lot of moves. We have Jarvis Landry joining the team. We have Tyrod Taylor joining the team. Demarius Randall, cornerback, former Green Bay Packers, joining the dog pound. They sent away Deshaun Kaiser, and I'm here to break it down for you, give you my perspective, kind of get together some of the content that I've been reading about it and bring it to you guys the best that I can in regards to 2018 fantasy football season, like I usually do. I want to say a couple things before I uh, before we kick off the video. If you're not entered, I'm giving away one of these free mini belts, uh, fantasy football champion belt from fantasyjocks.com. Uh, to enter the giveaway, all you got to do is go follow me on Instagram. It's BDGE underscore fantasy football. Everything will be linked in the description. Go follow me. Go comment on one of my recent pictures. End the comment with the hashtag BDGE. I don't care what you comment, but end it with BDGE hashtag, and you're automatically entered. I'm going to be giving away one of these, as well as one of the BDGE dad hats to one of you guys, and that's going to end at the end of this week, so make sure you do that soon. Also, if you enjoy the video, give it the thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're coming at you with fantasy football stuff all off season, up until your draft, throughout the season, all that, yada, yada, yada. I got to get into this video because I got to shoot this, edit it, upload it, bring it to you guys in the next hour because I got to get a haircut. I got my haircut appointment in one hour, so let's do this. All right, so the new GM in Cleveland, John Dorsey, was not fucking around in the last 24 hours, right? This is what their offense looks of as of today. Looks looks like as of today. Sorry if I ramble and I go so fast. Like I said, I'm I'm in a hurry here. Tyrod Taylor, quarterback, running back, Duke Johnson. They got Josh Gordon. They got Jarvis Landry. They got Corey Coleman. They got David Njoku as their offensive lineup. That is a damn powerhouse. That's so much athleticism on one team. I feel like they could be an NBA team. Like Tyrod at point guard, Duke Johnson shooting guard, Josh Gordon. Josh Gordon is like the LeBron James. He could play center, power forward, shooting guard if you need to. David Njoku, uh, nah, Njoku's like that center. He's like Dwight Howard. He'll eh, Not like Dwight Howard because I was going to say he'll bang in the paint. Dwight Howard don't do that shit. Jarvis Landry, like a great sixth man of the year. And uh, Corey Coleman, like a small forward. What a squad that have. So that's their offense. That's what it looks like, right? They also have the first pick in the draft, the fourth pick in the draft, the 33rd and the 35th pick. So four picks in the top 35. They also have the 64th overall pick and uh, like five picks between rounds three and seven after that. So this team is obviously on the up and up. The first guy we're going to talk about is Tyrod Taylor, right? The Bills, man, I love Ty God. And uh, he was super underutilized. He was disrespected in Buffalo, and it was only a matter of time before they got rid of him, right? So they shipped him over to Cleveland in exchange for the 65th, 65, 65th overall pick. Uh, Coach Hugh Jackson of the Browns said he didn't want to start a rookie quarterback in week one of 2018. He wasn't lying, right? He wasn't lying. Taylor, Tyrod is going to be working with easily the best group of weapons he's ever had in his career now that he's in uh, Cleveland. And, you know, he's got Josh Gordon, Jarvis Landry, Corey Coleman, Njoku, Duke Johnson, and depending on what they do in the draft, obviously. Taylor will bring a new angle to this offense, right? One one that doesn't turn the ball over like three to nine times a game. Taylor's been one of the most efficient quarterbacks in the NFL over the last like three or so years in terms of taking care of the ball. Since 2015, so 2015 through 2017, He's posted a 51 to 16 touchdown to interception ratio. That's a, that's more than three to one, which is incredible for an NFL quarterback. 65 to 21 if you include rushing scores and fumbles lost. So he's been a really, really underrated quarterback in the NFL in terms of not turning the ball over. Um, and that's something you need in an NFL quarterback. And you look at this stat from PFF, he's had he had the third lowest uh, interception rate from a clean pocket in 2017. Only Breeze and Cousins were better throwing from a clean pocket. Obviously, a lot of NFL quarterbacks are going to be good throwing from a clean pocket. So if the Browns can can uh, can put together a strong offensive line, uh, which is 
going to be a big question mark, which I'll touch on in, in a few minutes. Uh, that's going to be huge for Taylor because he is good at throwing from a clean pocket, obviously. The efficiency is there. The problem that people have had with Taylor and the reason people, some people don't like him, I guess NFL GMs and stuff, is that you know we we haven't seen his efficiency at scale, meaning we haven't seen him be able to put up uh, that high of efficiency while boasting like big volume through the air. He has yet to throw the ball more than 437 times in a season or throw for more than 3,100 passing yards in, in any of the last three seasons. I think he would have done it this year, 2017, had they not shipped away Sammy Watkins and Robert Woods, his top two receiving options. Charles Clay was hurt for most of the most of the year. Their offensive line kind of fell apart there in Buffalo. So there's like no quarterback that's done as much as with as little as Tyrod has over the last couple of years, right? I'm, I'm excited to see him get a fresh start and really be the guy in this offense, at least for the next year. You know, Tyrod loves to chuck the ball downfield, and that was taken away from him when they got rid of Sammy Watkins. He'll get that back with Josh Gordon. So you take a look at this chart, right? I was looking at his average depth of throw over the last few years, and you see, you know, 2015, 2016, he was amongst the league leaders in average depth of throw, 10.7, 9.8, ranked third and sixth in the NFL. Those were years with Sammy Watkins in the lineup. You take away Sammy Watkins and you look at him last year, right? He had no one to throw to downfield and he fell back from sixth in the NFL all the way down to 19th in the NFL. I know that chart looks ugly as shit, but that's all I had to work with this morning and I'm not very good at Excel. So you know what, just work with me here. Now, as I was talking about the offensive line, that's gonna be a big key as to whether or not this, as to whether or not Tyrod can succeed in Cleveland and whether or not this offense runs fluidly. They were super hyped heading into 2017, right? People were like, oh, top five, uh, top five offensive line. And I, I thought that was like out of control at the time because they did add a few pieces, but I, I just didn't think they were as good as people were hyping them up to be. They were disappointing last season following, obviously, Joe Thomas got injured. He finally broke his like snap streak or game, game streak count, got injured, was out for the rest of the season, and their offensive line not crumbled, but it was not anywhere near as good as people thought it was going to be. Uh, football Outsiders had them finish as the league's 22nd best pass blocking line. They do still boast one of the top guard duos in the NFL between Kevin Zietler and Joe uh, Bid what's it? Uh, Betonio or something. I forget how you pronounce it, but they're two of the top guards in the NFL right now. Joe Thomas, like I said, he missed all of last season, basically. He is contemplating retirement. Supposedly it's 50-50 right now, and he's going to make a decision in the next couple of weeks or in the next week or two, and that's going to be a huge piece to this offense of whether or not uh, this line comes together. It's a huge upgrade, obviously, if he, can, if he comes back, and I'm expecting that these additions to the Cleveland Browns along with the draft picks and stuff they're going to have is going to be a huge factor in whether or not he comes back because he probably wants to play on a team that's going to contend right and this is the first time in a while that he'll be able to do that so you know with all these moves and with everything going on does this make Tyrod a draftable fantasy quarterback again sure I think definitely if uh if you were on board with drafting Tyrod in any of the last previous years while he was on the Bills, why wouldn't you be okay drafting him again with the Browns now in, in an in improved offense with more weapons and things like that? So, yeah, I would not be surprised at all to see him finish in the top 12. If, if he's the starter for the Browns and he plays the whole season, I would not be surprised at all to see him finish as a top 12 quarterback you know, on a points-per-game basis like he has basically each of the last few seasons. Like I said, it was a down year last year in terms of statistics because he didn't have any weapons to work with. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely on board with Tyrod as a uh, as a fantasy quarterback again in 2018. Um, the more interesting part on a real life basis is now what does Cleveland do with those with those draft picks? What do they do in the draft? They have the one and the four pick. Before the move, you know, a lot of people expected them to look for a quarterback. Um, they used a second round pick, obviously, on Deshaun Kaiser, which we'll talk about later in the video to, uh, to, to take over in the future. Didn't work out. Now, do they take one for the future again? Now, Tyrod's contract is only, he's only on contract for one more year. So he's on contract through 2018. Will they look to extend him throughout the season? Probably not. I still definitely think they're going to go with a quarterback with one of the first two picks that they have, either the one or the four spot. I don't think this shores up Saquon Barkley to be the number one pick whatsoever. Um, I mean, obviously, it fuels the hype train that, that people believe that's what's going to happen. But I think it works. I think it works great for them that if they can get, you know, they're going to choose on one guy that they love at quarterback, and I I still kind of expect them to take him at one overall. And if they think he needs to be groomed for one year, 
that's that's perfectly fine, right? It's a good situation because Tyrod has a one-year contract. They let him be the starter. They let him play throughout the year. I don't think they have any thoughts of contending for a championship. So build the team, build the quarterback under Tyrod. Let him not make a fucking complete fool and embarrassment of the Browns fan base for one year, and then 2019 they look to you know make a push for the playoffs. So um, there's still you know with all these moves, there's still they still have the second most free cap space behind only the Jets now. Um, so they might not, not even be done in free agency. So, I, you know, I, I still think they go with a quarterback in the top four. Uh, will they go with Saquon Barkley one and then a quarterback four? I don't know. If they find a guy that they really think is the future, is the franchise, I don't think they'll let him pass up at one and, you know, bank on him being there at four. So that, that's my thoughts on Tyrod. We'll move to Jarvis Landry. And this is where things get interesting because from a fantasy perspective, he's been such a consistent producer over the last three, four years, um, especially in PPR leagues, right? In the first, he's been in the NFL for four years. He has averaged over 100 catches, over 1,000 yards over that four-year span. Oh, he's the only player ever to catch more than 100 passes and finish with less than 1,000 yards in a season. That's neither here nor there. He did it last year. Um, so Miami ships him off uh, after he signs that franchise tenda, that chicken tenda, uh, for the tune of 16 million bucks. Ship him off for the fourth and seventh round pick for a fourth and a seventh round, not the fourth pick, uh, fourth and seventh round pick. Now he's been a huge part of the, <clears throat> the Dolphins passing game, obviously, over the last few years. He had a 28% target share uh, among aimed passes, not, you know, Pro Football Focus talks about aimed passes as well as just overall passes because a lot of them go out of bounds or not not targeted. But 28% target share on the Dolphins of aimed passes. That uh, that number was almost identical in 2016. So he's seeing like really heavy wide receiver one type target share in Miami. It's hard to imagine him getting those same type of targets in Cleveland with all the other weapons there. Josh Gordon, Josh Gordon, Corey Coleman, Joku, Duke Johnson, depending on what else they do in the draft, obviously. If they don't go with Barkley, or even if they do go with Barkley in the draft, Duke Johnson will remain a huge piece of this offense if they don't go with Barkley. And Duke Johnson, you know, he's a big piece of that passing game as well in Cleveland. And him and Landry are probably going to be fighting for the same targets if he is uh, if he is their running back, right? They run a lot of those underneath slot routes. Like hit. Landry's depth of target is awful. It's like six six yards, something like that. It's higher than that, but you get the point. The Dolphins, right behind Landry last year, the highest target total another player on the Dolphins had in either 2016 or 2017 was Kenny Stills last year. He had 101 targets, which is 18% of their targets. Now, you think of Josh Gordon, you have to think he's going to get as, you know, he looked pretty good. He's going to be back in really good shape in 2018. You have to think he's going to get anywhere from like a 22 to a 26% target share in that offense. 22 is definitely being open it's definitely being uh on the lower side if you're estimating it 26 percent would be around wide receiver one type numbers which is what gordon is now you look back over the last five weeks of 2017 right that was that was josh gordon's return to the cleveland's lineup he saw 41 of 154 aimed passes which is 26.6 percent of their targets you look at the rest of the team duke johnson had 28 targets 18 percent Corey Coleman had 23 targets, 15%. And then you look at Rashard Higgins and Ricardo Lewis combined, who were Cleveland slot guys. They had 15 total over the last five weeks, which is less than 10%. So Gordon saw 26.6% of the targets over the last five weeks. Now that's like, that's what I'm saying is Landry is not going to see 28% of the targets like he did in Miami. He's going to see a lot less than that. So we went back last year, looked at games that Landry played with Devonta Parker on the field in 2017. We saw about the same production in terms of fantasy points overall, but you see that Landry averaged three more targets per game and about 1.15 touchdowns more per game when Parker was out of the lineup as opposed to when he was in. And that actually doesn't take into account the game where Parker left on the first um on the first play of the, uh, like one of the first drives of the game. Let me actually look that up real quick. And I, I'm pretty sure Landry kind of went off that game too. So these stats probably are even more skewed. Uh, what game is that? One for one. I think it was week five versus Tennessee. Yeah, and Landry had 
10 targets, five catches, 44 yards, and a touchdown. So those numbers would be even more heavily favored for when Parker wasn't in the lineup. Basically what I'm saying is, you know, obviously Landry's gonna produce more when a guy like Parker, AKA a guy like Josh Gordon, is not in the lineup. Um, you know, I personally think this, this move hurts both Jarvis Landry and Corey Coleman from a fantasy perspective. There's no way you can expect a statistical breakout for Corey Coleman, even though this is gonna be his third year when most players take a big step up or, or break out. Um, there's no way you can expect a statistical breakout with Coleman and, and with Josh Gordon and Jarvis Landry in the lineup now, right? You're going to be tar fighting for a lot of those targets. I'm still perfectly fine taking Josh Gordon, where his ADP is right now, like 38 to 40 in that range. I think it's going to keep moving up and up. Um, maybe it won't, though. Maybe people are going to be like, oh, you know, he has to split so many targets with Landry and Coleman now that I'm, I'm not okay taking him in the first three or four rounds. I, com I definitely am okay taking Gordon as... Uh, in you know, in the late third round, fourth round kind of pick. So uh, you know, him and Landry do not share the same targets, right? Gordon is an outside receiver. He gets the deep balls, posts. He, he gets a lot of those really valuable uh, fantasy targets where Landry does not. So I'm looking at Landry as more of like a mid wide receiver two, maybe like a mid low wide receiver two in PPR leagues, as opposed to the wide receiver one spot that he finished in in 2017. So that's Tyrod, that's Jarvis. Uh, make sure you give the video a thumbs up, please, if you've enjoyed so far. I'm gonna make sure that the camera's still rolling, 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 Woo! Yeah, we Gucci. Oh, we only had 17 minutes, so I'm gonna bang out these last two in the last couple, uh, last few minutes. So Demarius Randall, uh, the former cornerback for the Green Bay Packers, goes to Cleveland for, uh, I forget what they even traded him for. I think it was just Demarius Randall for Deshaun Kaiser straight up. Now, Randall's just two years removed, right, from being a first-round pick. He was the Packers' first-round pick in 2015. He's been extremely inconsistent. I've heard he had some some problems with the coaching staff, so I guess they were they were really looking to move him quickly. He's flashed his ceiling, but he's also flashed his floor plenty of times. You know, on any given Sunday, you don't know what you're getting out of him. He'll have plenty of interceptions, plenty of pass breakups, but he also will let up high pass ratings, a lot of yards, a lot of touchdowns, things like that. Now. Maybe he's not fit to be a uh, cornerback one, right? So him joining the Browns could be a good thing. Now they have a pretty good secondary. You look at Jason McCourty, you look at Demarius Randall, and they have another guy that most of you guys probably don't know. I don't even know how to pronounce his name. Brienne Body Calhoun, ba Buddy Calhoun, I don't know. Uh, McCourty and Buddy Calhoun both finished as top 27 cornerbacks uh, as per PFF. So they're boasting a pretty strong group of cornerbacks possible that Demarius Randall makes a position shift. He was a safety in college, so maybe they'll look to move him to safety and uh, things will work out better there just with a fresh start. So I think that's a good move for Cleveland too. Getting rid of Kaiser. Uh, you know, this is a problem I have with NFL teams. Most of them are trash at drafting. Most of them are trash at scouting, drafting, developing. They picked Kaiser with a second round pick last year already, getting rid of him. But if you want to trade a second round pick, like the value is so high, right? Teams don't want to give up anyone for a second round pick. It's like maybe second round picks aren't that valuable like because you guys suck at drafting and developing. So that's just what we see with Kaiser here. Now, this was an easy move, right? The, this experiment did not work out. Hugh Jackson and the Browns destroyed this kid, his potential, his confidence. Now, he needed, when he was coming out of the draft, right, or as a prospect, he was a big arm guy that could shut the ball and had a lot of power behind his throws, but... He needed to develop. He needed to have uh, someone he could sit behind and learn from. And this couldn't have been a better landing spot for him than Green Bay, right? Rodgers is, what, 34 years old. He'll have a minimum three, four, probably another like six years in the NFL. So Kaiser's going to sit behind him. He's a long-term project, but I think this was a great move by the Packers. Let him learn from Rodgers for three or four years. Get that confidence back. Let him learn an NFL offense. Let him, you know, be able to just be comfortable in an offense and not have to have all this pressure. Uh, I, I just think it was a really good move on Green Bay's part, Mike. On Green Bay's part to grab Kaiser as a backup quarterback. So that that's an interesting move to me. Overall, that's gonna wrap up the video. Make sure that you give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're gonna have videos like this all off season. I don't think I'm gonna make video, uh, maybe I will make videos like this like consistently, but there will be like free agency recaps, like once the free agency period comes to an end, I'll do like a quarter, like each position I'll do a video for and do a recap for it. So um, again, just make sure you're following me on Instagram, BDGE underscore fantasy football. Comment with a hashtag BDGE at the end and you'll be entered into win this. I'll announce the winner 
uh, probably next Thursday, so five days from today. And that'll be a video, so just stay tuned for that. And I hope you all enjoyed. I'll see you all next time. Peace.